Uh, really? This couldn't even wait until February for this shit? Uh, fine, be that way, better now than when he's, like, nominated to the Supreme Court or something. So, Louis C.K. has been trying to stage a comeback pretty much ever since the popular culture politely asked him to please go away for a while. A return to the public eye hotly demanded by fans of a TV show I'm fairly certain was watched way more by critics and reviewers than actual audiences, and guys who desperately need to believe that a slightly above average command of verbal gymnastics can also excuse a terrible personality and lack of social filter in a famous person so that it might someday also apply to them. I don't know that it needs to be rehashed or dwelt on at any great length read the whys and hows of Louis becoming a persona non grata in the world of comedy over the last year, though sidebar, for those of you who may or may not have had cause or opportunity, professional or otherwise, to interact with the world of stand-up comedy, do you have any idea how gross you have to be to be over the line with comedians? Okay, the comedian world is like the rock musician world, except it's all the after-the-house-lights-up parts where everyone's sober. The important broad strokes of it are that a guy who was known for being a fairly thoughtful, hard-to-categorize comic who gained fame by balancing edgy material with actual introspection about the ignorance and ugliness that informs such material, especially as it existed within his own psyche, had to take the long walk off stage when it turned out he'd been conducting himself in a much uglier and frankly more abusive way than even his material would have copped to in reality, vowing at the time to mend his ways and think on his actions, and now he's come roaring back, quite a bit sooner than even his most forgiving booster might have anticipated, with a new stand-up set that's jettisoned much of his earlier persona for a new tone of angry, self-righteous vindictiveness wherein he rages against the injustice seemingly done to him and in particular rails against the supposed oversensitivity of the younger generation, reserving particular bile for youths who request gender non-conforming pronouns and the survivor activists of the Parkland school shooting massacre. Now, I'm not here to do an episode about whether or not the jokes are funny or if it's too soon for him to be staging a comeback or not, but since you're gonna ask, I don't think the set is particularly very funny, and it is way too soon for him to be trying for a comeback, in my subjective opinion. I'd also be remiss not to point out that a certain sense of cosmic confluence that this particular comedian attempting a comeback with this particular type of material happened in the same relative time frame as a seemingly out-of-nowhere pop culture backlash against the so-called Hope Punk movement, a decidedly silly named, but in my opinion at least, valid enough push to categorize a noted preference among Generation Z post-millennials for fiction and pop culture that invinced an upwardly optimistic framework as opposed to the dystopian apocalyptic bent that had been in vogue previously that triggered an embarrassingly enraged outspewing of these damn kids-isms about the young folk being too soft and genial and whatever neoliberal is supposed to mean this week, and not knowing what real punk and real rebellion is, and somehow it's also Lin-Manuel Miranda and Obama's fault, I think. I honestly have no f***ing idea. Maybe a whole bunch of shitty clickbait writers all found out their sons were secretly big into Steven Universe at the same Christmas potluck and just couldn't deal. But that and the formerly relevant writer-director of Pootie Tang going all kids these days over teenagers wanting to march on Washington instead of whatever played out sweat hoggy and shenanigans to find cool when he was a whippersnapper kind of felt like the same cloud of negative energy passing through, but maybe it's just me. But anyway, topical and or personal comedy has always had a difficult time with the concept of aging and generational transitions and social standings. In fact, it's kind of amusing to me that one of the few areas where baby boomers and Generation Xers ended up on the same page is that it's unavoidably frustrating when you try and make your generational brand rebellion and permanent adolescence, and you can't help but end up as weird old hippies accusing your kids of being the squares. Hell, that comedy premise itself is so old and relatively safe it was the foundation for Family Ties, a famously sunny, fuzzy sitcom that debuted back in 1982, meaning that Louis CK could have been watching it when he was 15 years old. I mean, if you want a working definition of weak sauce as it applies to stand-up comedy, a set that can be handily dunked on by the out-of-touch old man character from The Simpsons from season 7 in 1995 would be it. I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. To be honest, the set itself is so trite and familiar to anyone who scrolled the front page of Reddit or unwittingly followed their one weird uncle's Facebook link to Breitbart News recently, I'd be hard-pressed to say anything with enough bite in it to be genuinely offensive. If anything offends me about it, it's the obviously cynical, calculated nature of the thing. If I can just make the conversation about how oversensitive SJWs are yelling at me for not being politically correct for long enough, it'll start to feel like that's why I got vanished instead of the whole abusive sex pest thing. My little Roman Polanski. <laughs> what? What's wrong with being Roman Polanski? <laughs> He what? You monster! And then I can make a comeback on that and ride out the back half of my career doing sold-out shows to the same undemanding, easy lay audience that's keeping South Park on the air and probably still mad about Roseanne. Now look, far be it from me, a man who on a different show does jokes about video games on the internet, to pretend that shock humor can't be funny, that certain topics should simply be subject to a blanket taboo where you just can't tell jokes about these things. I don't believe that, in those words or in general, and I'd be a giant hypocrite if I did, but what I do believe is that if you're gonna do it, you have to do it really well, and I don't mean that in a rules of social decorum sense. I mean that in the sense of, if there's no stud in that part of the wall, you have to use a drywall anchor if you want the shelf to take any weight. The thing about shock comedy is that it's a fundamentally adult medium that feels fundamentally childish, but is not. See, children tend to think that anything shocking, surprising, jostling, transgressive, sudden and out of the ordinary, etc., and the often extreme responses that they elicit are innately profound because as children they're still developing their emotional lexicon and psychological matrices, which is a snobby way of saying that's why children tend to laugh so hard at relatively simple, blunt force transgressive behaviors like slapstick, pratfalls, scatological humor, and inappropriate language being deployed in formal situations when it comes to 
to comedy. And because most people in the mass media age first encounter shock comedy of one type or another, shock comedy at its core, of course, typically beginning or revolving around a comedian saying something you and they both know they're not supposed to say in some sense as children, there's a tendency to think of it in those simple terms, that what's noteworthy or important about even good, insightful shock comedy is the shock itself, the initial, oh my god, I can't believe he just said that moment that gets the gasps and nervous titters from the adult audience but belly laughs from the kids, who are mostly just thrilled at the prospect of getting away with something by proxy and will typically lack the experiential maturity or crucial sense of context to meaningfully distinguish between ha ha ha, he farted out loud, you're not supposed to fart out loud so it's funny that he did, ha ha ha, he said the F word, you're not supposed to say the F word so it's funny that he did, ha ha ha, he said the N word, you're not supposed to say the N word so it's funny that he did, or ha ha ha, he made fun of school shooting victims, you're not supposed to do that so it's funny that he did. See, there's always been shock comedy or blue humor, to use phraseology older than even most of my grandmother's best furniture, but the key aspect that defines much of the great shock material that culture lionizes, other comics aspire to, and people in general point to his examples and justifications, I'm talking everyone from your Lenny Bruce to your Richard Pryor, Red Fox to Dice Clay, Sam Kennison, George Carlin, CK himself in certain sets, guys like Gilbert Gottfried and Bob Saget after a fashion, Howard Stern, sure, the all-too-rare women who were able to persevere in the format, like Moms Mabley, Sarah Silverman, Roseanne, Sandra Bernhardt early on, Wanda Sykes, look guys, I only get to do one of these shows a week, I'm sorry if I left your favorite out, you get the idea, is that nine times out of ten, the shock in the joke routine set narrative whatever isn't the punchline, because that's easy, surprise, naughty word, gotcha, it's the setup. The shock isn't just I said this, but rather I introduced this gross or taboo or off-limits otherwise forbidden thing you should not joke about as the jumping off point of my joke. It's the standing on stage telling jokes version of an acrobat taking the safety net away, or climbing to a higher beam, or lighting one of the hoops on fire, or a juggler taking a chainsaw out of the prop bag, or a serious dramatic production casting John Voight after 1999 or so, or the White House press secretary saying, sure, the president will take a few on-screen questions now, a declaration that you're about to do something ill-advised that could go horribly wrong, but will look amazing if you pull it off. The great shock comics were almost never expecting the big laugh from just going to a dark place. They went to dark places because when they still stuck the landing and pulled a big laugh out of it, it was all the more impressive. There's also, crucially, the issue of context. Just as working without a net is only impressive if the lack of net clearly raises the possibility of a fall killing you, shock comedy isn't actually all that impressive a feat if there's no risk involved in blowing the joke and having the ugliness of the shock overwhelm and poison the audience against you. You're not doing shock comedy or being transgressive or speaking truth to power or sticking it to the man or even being very funny, most likely, if the audience or the broader culture isn't going to be on your side and you don't have a point outside of being on their side to begin with. Lenny Bruce's famous say the n-word a bunch of times until it's defanged and loses all meaning routine was not shocking or transgressive simply because he said that word. Lenny was doing those sets in the 50s and early 60s, pretty much the height of the tail end of the era when it was more than okay for a white person like Lenny Bruce to say that word. The transgression, the taboo being broken, wasn't saying the word, it was saying it in an impolitic context. In other words, the actual definition of not being politically correct. Hey, hey, Lenny, whoa, hey, no, not here, wrong crowd. That word's for the poor whites who can only use language or physical violence to abuse minorities and feel big. You're in a club in a city, people are hip and diverse-ish and paid their money. Here we don't do racism with words, we express it by denying them bank loans and not renting apartments and over-policing. You're upsetting the order, putting it all out in the open like that. Come on, that was the edgy, shocking, dangerous thing about that routine. The very strong chance that the crowd would turn on him for making them part of the punchline. But a comic today, in his 50s, famously disgraced for being gross and abusive to women, doing the younger generation is too sensitive, things are different now and it sucks, what happened to when men were men, are you triggered, snowflake? Those kind of jokes to the sort of audience that turns out to see a performance by that sort of guy in the first place? That's the opposite of dangerous. That's safe. That's the safest possible jokes he could be telling to the most receptive possible audience in the least challenging or daring context. Laugh at it if you like, defend it if you think it's somehow necessary, but let's drop this thing about how anyone who thought it was a dreary set just can't handle shock humor. Because whatever else this was, it doesn't deserve to get mentioned alongside George Carlin and Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor and all those other guys, and it's definitely not shocking it's preaching. I'm Bob, and thanks for letting me pontificate about the minutiae of comedy writing for probably too long. Uh, I promise next week I'll do a show about, like, Transformers or something. Honest. Mm -hmm.